the Montgomerys. The origins of the Montgomerys and their place in Scotland's history. Descendants of Anglo-Normans who came north to Scotland in the train of David I in the 12th century, proud bearers of the name of Montgomery are heirs to a glorious tradition of service to not only the Scottish crown, but to that of France. Renowned for their knightly valor and prowess with arms, the family accumulated glittering honors and titles over the centuries, while many continue to find fame and fortune today on the international stage. Read here of their rich and colorful heritage. Why, I just might. Let me see what the name of these short little chapters are. Number one, Origins of Scottish Surnames. Chapter two, Knightly Valor. Chapter three, Feuds and Vendettas. And chapter four, Fame and Acclaim. Hmm. It all began with the Normans. For it was they who introduced surnames into common usage more than a thousand years ago, initially based on the title of their estates, local villages, and chateau in France to distinguish and identify these land holdings, usually acquired at the point of a blood-stained sword. Such grand descriptions also helped enhance the prestige of these arrogant warlords and generally glorify their lofty positions high above the humble serfs slaving away below in the pecking order, who only had single names, often with biblical connotations, as in Pierre and Jacques. There's a little picture right there, and I continue on. Going to get some of our family history here. The only descriptive distinctions among this uh, peasantry concern their occupation, like Pierre the swineherd or Jacques the ferryman. The Normans themselves were originally Vikings or Northmen who raided, colonized, and eventually settled down around the French coastline. They had sailed up the Seine in their longboats in 900 AD under their ferocious leader, Rollo, and ruled the Roost in northeast France before sailing over to conquer England, bringing their relatively new tradition of having surnames with them. It took another hundred years for the Normans to percolate northwards, and surnames did not begin to appear in Scotland until the 13th century. These adventurous knights brought an aura of chivalry with them, and it was said no damsel of any distinction would marry a man unless he had at least two names. The family names included that of Scotland's great hero, Robert de Bruce. Robert de Bruce. I remember that on uh, that Mel Gibson movie. And his compatriots were warriors from families like the de Morbles, de Umphravels, de Berkeley, de Quincy's, de de Ponce and de Vaux. As the knights settled the boundaries of their vast estates, they took territorial names as in Hamilton, Moray, Crawford, Cunningham, Dunbar, Ross, Wemyss, Dundas, Galloway, Renfrew, Greenhill, Hazelwood, Sandy Lands, and Churchill. Other names, though not with any obvious geographical or topographical features, nevertheless, derived from ancient parishes like Douglas, Forbes, Daliel, and Guthrie. Other surnames were coined in connection with occupations, castles, or legendary deeds. Stuart originated in the word steward, a prestigious post, which was an integral part of any large medieval household. The same applied to cooks, chamberlains, constables, and porters. See, I've heard all those names, but that comes from what they did for a living. Borders, towns, and forts needed in areas like the debatable lands, which were constantly fought over by feuding local family, families, had their own distinctive names, and it was often from them that the resident groups took their communal titles, as in the Grahams of Annandale, the Elliots and Armstrongs of the East Marches, 
the Scots and Kerrs of Tiviotdale and Eskdale. Even physical attributes crept into surnames, as in small, little, and more, the latter being big in Gaelic. Long or lang, stark, stout, strong or strang, and even jolly. Mickel Johns would have had the strength of several men while Little John was named after a legendary sidekick of Robin Hood. Colors got into the act with black, white, gray, brown, and green. Red developed into reed, ruddy, or ruddiment. Blue was rare, and nobody ever wanted to be associated with yellow. Pompous Worthies took the name Wiseman, Goodman, and Goodall. Words Intimidating the sons of leading figures were soon affiliated into the language, as in John's son, Adam's son, Richard's son, and Tom's son, while the Norman equivalent of Fitz, from the French Latin filius, meaning son, cropped up in Fitzmaurice and Fitzgerald. I would also say Fitzpatrick. The prefix Mac was son of, and Gaelic and clans often originated with occupations, as in MacNab being sons of the abbot, MacPherson and MacVicar being sons of the minister, and MacIntosh being sons of the chief. The church's influence could be found in the names Kirk, Clerk, Clark, Bishop, Friar, and Monk. Proctor came from a church official, Singer and Sangster from Choristers, Gilchrist and Gillies from Christ's Servant, Mitchell, Gilmore and Gilmore from servants at St. Michael and Mary, Malcolm from a servant of Columba, and Gillespie from a bishop's servant. All right, come on, get on with Montgomery. I feel like I'm reading those big long lines in the Bible where they say was a son of his son. The rudimentary medical profession was represented by Barber, a trade which also once included dentistry and surgery, <laughs> as well as leech or leash. Businessmen produced merchants, mercers, money pennies, chapmans, sellers, and scales. While down at the old village water mill, the names that cropped up included Miller, Walker, and Fuller. Other self-explanatory trades included <gasps> Coopers, Brands, Barkers, Tanners, Skinners, Brewsters, Brewers, Tailors, Saddlers, Wrights, Cartwright, Smiths, Help, Harpers, Joiners, Sawyers, Masons, and Plumbers. <gasps> <clears throat> <coughs> From the, uh, uh, even the scenery was utilized as in Craig, Moor, Hill, Glen, Wood, and Forest. Forest Gump. Rank, whether high or low, took its place with Laird, Baron, Knight, Tenant, Farmer, Husband, Granger, Greve, Shepherd, Shearer, and Fletcher. The hunt and the chase supplied Hunter, Falconer, Fowler, Fox, and Forester. Archer and Spearman. I've heard all, most of these names. The renowned medieval historian Broisart, who eulicized about the romantic deeds of chivalry and who condemned Scotland as being a poverty-stricken wasteland, once sniffily dismissed the peasantry of his native France as the Jacquerie, or the Jacques without names. But it was these same humble folk who ended up overthrowing the arrogant aristocracy in the olden days. Only the blue-blooded knights of antiquity were entitled to a full, proper names, both Christian and surnames. But with the passing of time and a more egalitarian, less feudal atmosphere, more respectful and worthy titles spread throughout the populace as a whole. Echoes of a far distant past can be found in most names, and they can be born with pride in commemoration of past generations who fought and toiled in some capacity or other to make our nation what it is now, for good or ill. All right, there's the whole general thing about names. Now let's get to Montgomery. Chapter 2, Knightly Valor. A powerful family of Norman nobles were the original bearers of what became the proud name of Montgomery, and they, in turn, are believed to have taken their name from a Roman commander by the name of Gomericus, who held lands in Gaul, now present-day France. 
Comericus had given his name to the lands of Calvados in Normandy, and for centuries the ancestors of today's Montgomerys held the castle of St. Foy de Montgomery at Le Seul. From the roots in the soil of Normandy, the Montgomerys were to flourish in later centuries in England, Wales, and Scotland, owning vast tracts of land and the recipients of a glittering array of honors and titles. A Roger de Montgomery, spelled a little bit different, whose mother was a distant relation of William, Duke of Normandy, accompanied him on his conquest of England in 1066 and was in the thick of the bloody combat at the Battle of Hastings. This battle-hardened warrior was rewarded with not only the lands of Chichester and Arundel, but also the earldom of Arundel. Not content to rest on his well-deserved laurels, however, he was also at the forefront of the Norman invasion of Wales, capturing the Baldwin Castle. Go, Roger! So significant was his impact on Wales that both a Welsh town and county still bear his name. During this reign from 1124 until 1153 of Scotland's David I, who had spent a period of his life at the English court, a number of Anglo-Normans were invited to settle in Scotland. Among them was a Robert Montgomery, who obtained lands at Eaglesham in Renfrewshire. Further lands and honors were to follow over succeeding centuries, as the Montgomerys played a leading role in their adopted nation's frequently turbulent affairs. It should be pointed out, that the spelling of the name varies between Montgomery, the way we do it, and Montgomery, so instead of a Y at the end, it's just I-E. But for the sake of clarity, the more common form of Montgomery is the one adopted for the purposes of this brief historical narrative of the family's colorful lives and times coming up shortly. One of the earliest Montgomerys to feature in Scotland's role of battle honors was Sir John Montgomery, 7th Baron of Eaglesham, who was one of the heroes of the Battle of Otterburn in Northumberland on August 19, 1388. The Scots had earlier been involved in a skirmish outside the walls of Newcastle when the Scottish commander, James, the 2nd Earl of Douglas, managed to snatch the silk pennant from the lance of his adversary, Henry Percy, heir to the first Earl of Northumberland and better known to posterity as Henry Hotspur. Douglas proceeded to lead his army back towards Scotland, but Hotspur, stung by the insult to his honor, swore his precious pennant would never be allowed to cross the border. He pursued Douglas, and the two armies clashed at Ar Otterburn, the young Earl receiving a fatal blow. As the Scots army faltered, demoralized over the fate of their commander, the famed banner of the bloody heart of the Douglases was raised. However, and this rallied the Scots to victory. Crucial to the victory was the capture of Hotspur by Sir John Montgomery, after the two had engaged in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat, with an exhausted and blood-spattered Montgomery at last emerging the victor. The famous duel is recalled in the Ballad of Chevy Chase, <laughs> which describes how the two knights swiped swords and blood flew from their injuries. In keeping with the chivalric code of the time, high-ranking prisoners such as Hotspur were ransomed for vast sums of money, and the ransom Montgomery received for his defeated foe allowed him to build Pole Noon Castle at Eaglesham. Later, through a marriage to the heiress of Sir Hugh Eglinton, he acquitted the baronies of Eglinton and Ardrison in Ayrshire. We still have a castle in Ayrshire. I, I went past it. To this day, the Montgomery connections with the conservation village of Eaglesham, situated on the southern outskirts of Glasgow, 
are recalled in the form of street names and a local hotel. An example of the Montgomery selfless actions on behalf of the Scottish crown came in 1424 when Sir John Montgomery of Ardrossan was one of the sons of the Scottish nobility who was taken as a hostage to England to secure the release from captivity of James I. James had become a pawn in the struggle between powerful nobles and his father, Robert III, culminating in him being carried for his own safety to the refuge of Bass Rock in the Firth of Forth. I went to the Firth of Forth when I was in Scotland. He stayed here for about a month before a merchant vessel picked him up in March of 1406 to take him to more secure refuge in France. But English pirates captured the ship off Flamborough, Heed, and the 11-year-old prince was taken into the custody of England's Henry V. Robert III died only a few weeks later, and the young prince now became James I of Scotland. He was not released from custody until the signing of the Treaty of London of December of 1423, which made arrangements that he would be released only for a ransom of 40,000 pounds, payable over six years, while 21 sons of the Scottish nobility were to be taken as hostages until the full payment, the full amount was paid. This book cost me $2.50 pounds. Two dollars, I'll say two pounds and fifty half pounds, however you say it. They don't have cents. Where were I? Sir John Montgomery was one of these hostages who sacrificed his own freedom in the service of his king. One of his sons, Sir Alexander Irvine, later became a trusted ambassador of the crown and was rewarded for his service when he was created Lord Montgomery in about 1449. The Montgomerys became caught up in a bitter power struggle when a group of influential nobles rebelled against James III in favor of his son and heir, the future James IV. The Montgomerys took the side of the young prince and fought against the king and his supporters at the Battle of Sauchyburn near Stirling in June of 1488, fleeing the battlefield a defeated James III was later mysteriously stabbed to death. You got another little illustration there. So you know what? Some people like storybooks with pictures. As reward for his support, Hugh, the third Lord Montgomery, was rewarded with a grant of Erin off the Ayrshire coast and the custodianship of the island's Brodick Castle. In September 1513, Lord Montgomery, who had been created Earl of Eglinton in about 1507, was one of the few to escape the terrible slaughter of the Battle of Flodden that claimed the lives of 5,000 Scots, including James IV, an archbishop, two bishops, 11 earls, 15 barons, 300 knights, and a partridge in a no, that's not them. The Scottish monarch had embarked on the venture that Queen Anne of France, under the terms of the Auld Alliance between Scotland and her nation, appealed to him to break a lance on her behalf and act as her chosen knight. Crossing the border into England at the head of a 25,000-strong army that included 7,500 clansmen and their kinsmen, James IV, had engaged a 20,000-strong force commanded by the Earl of Surrey. But despite their numerical superiority and bravery, they proved no match for the skilled English artillery and superior military tactics of Surrey. So that's Chapter 2. Chapter 3, Feuds and Vendettas. So we get to find out if we still own a castle. I'm ready to move into a castle. The Montgomery served not only the interests of the Scottish crown, but also the French crown. And this was through the all the alliance between the two nations, first forged way back by treaty in 1295. 
In later years, a Scots company served with distinction in the ranks of the French army. In 1425, in recognition of the com company's valor at the bloody battle against the English at Bernouille one year earlier, an elite unit was raised to serve as a permanent bodyguard to the French monarch. Divided into both the King's Guard and the King's Bodyguard, the units were collectively known as the Scots Guard. Granted great privileges and honors, their prestigious guard was composed of the sons of the, some of the noblest houses in Scotland, such as those of Montgomery, of Hay, Sinclair, Hamilton, Stuart, Seton, Cunningham, and Cockburn. They acted not only as soldiers and bodyguards, but also as courtiers and diplomats. Three members of the guard would stand on either side of the enthroned French monarch at state ceremonies, while guardsmen also slept in the royal bedchamber. In 1559, the captain of the Scots Guard was 29-year-old Count Gabriel Montgomery, and in July of that year he became involved in an incident that sent shockwaves throughout Europe. A great devotee of jousting, the French monarch Henry II had arranged a gala tournament in celebration of a peace treaty with the Habsburgs of Austria and the marriage of two of his daughters. Held in Paris, the gala tournament had attracted the cream of European royalty and a glittering retinue of nobles, and all had gone well until Henry insisted on entering the lists himself. He tilted against both the Duke of Savoy and Francis, Duke of Guise, before competing against the distrusted captain of the Scots Guard. Both men successfully clashed and splintered their lances against one another's shields, but in contravention of the normal rules of the joust, arranged for another contest. A splinter of wood from Montgomery's shattered lance, however, pierced the king through the right eye, entering his brain, and he died in agony several days later, but not before absolving Montgomery from any blame. Montgomery nevertheless resigned from his post of captain of the Scots Guard, and sometime later converted from Catholicism to Protestantism. He narrowly escaped the slaughter of what became known as the Massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day on August 24, 1572, when thousands of Protestant Huguenots in Paris and the surrounding countryside were hunted down and killed by rampaging Catholic mobs. Montgomery escaped by swimming the Seine and found refuge in England, later returning to France as a leading Protestant commander in the bloody wars of religion. He was betrayed and captured, however, and executed in 1574. Hugh, the third Earl of Edmonton, was a loyal supporter of the ill-starred Mary, Queen of Scots, and was among the nine earls, nine bishops, eighteen lairds, and others who signed a bond declaring their support. The Queen had been forced to abdicate and imprisoned in Lochleven Castle, but following her escape, her supporters rallied and met her foes, known as the Confederate Lords, at Langside, to the south of Glasgow on May the 13th, 1568. Her forces under the command of the Earl of Argyle had been en route to the mighty bastion of Dumbarton Castle, atop its near inaccessible eminence on Dumbarton Rock on the Clyde, when it was intercepted by a numerically inferior but tactful, tactically superior force led by her half-brother, the Earl of Moray. Cannon fire had been engaged between both sides before a force of Argyle's infantry tried to force a passage through to the village of Langside, but they were fired on by a disciplined body of musketeers and forced to retreat as Moray launched a cavalry charge on their confused ranks. The battle proved disastrous for Mary, Queen of Scots, and signaled the death knell of her cause. 
with more than 100 of her supporters killed or captured in Mary Force to flee into what she then naively thought would be the protection of England's Queen Elizabeth. The Earl of Eglinton was among those captured and imprisoned. Declared guilty of treason, he finally accepted the rule of Mary's son and successor, James VI. A bloody feud for more than two centuries had blighted the lives of the Montgomerys and their Ayrshire neighbors, the Cunninghams, plunged to new depths in the spring of 1586 when the young Hugh, fourth Earl of Eglinton, was murdered. His murder, however, only served to further inflame the hatred between the two families to the extent that the vendetta did not reach its exhausted conclusion until 75 years later in 16. 61. The spark that lit the flame of this vendetta came in 1448 when Sir Alexander Montgomery, a brother-in-law of Sir Robert Cunningham, was controversially made Bailey of Cunningham, a lucrative signature that the Cunninghams had held for a number of years and claimed belonged to them by right. Ten years later in 1458, Bailey ship was restored to the Cunninghams and the feud between the two families intensified. The Montgomerys burned down the Cunningham stronghold of Carolaw Castle in 1488, while the 1528 William Cunningham, 4th Earl of Glencairn, burned the Montgomery strongholds of Alf Eglinton Castle at Irvine, despite numerous attempts to broker a truce between the two families. The internecine warfare continued, with Montgomery's and Cunningham's being killed in a series of tit-for-tat killings. The slaying of a Cunningham by a Montgomery in 1584, apparently in self-defense, set off the tragic chain of events that led two years later to the murder of the young Earl of Eglinton. The Cunninghams had immediately decided to exact vengeance for the killing of their kinsman. A young man, Cunningham of Robertland, was selected for the task and accordingly insinuated himself into a close friendship with the young Hugh Montgomery, who became Earl on the death of his father in June of 1585. In April of 1586, the Earl, at the urging of his friend Cunningham of Robertland, accepted an invitation to dine at a house in the hostile Cunningham land of Laneshaw. But accompanied by only a few servants as he made his way back from the dinner, he was ambushed and killed by about 60 armed men who included Cunningham of Robertland. The men dead had dragged on, with countless numbers of Montgomerys and Cunninghams being slain or fleeing the country in fear of their lives. It did not end until 1661 when William Cunningham, 9th Earl of Glencairn, married Margaret Montgomery. <coughs> Maybe it was my sister Annie, Margaret Ann Montgomery, daughter of the 6th Earl of Eglinton. Their tradition of medieval tournaments, meanwhile, recalling a glorious age of chivalry was reenacted in 1839 when the 13th Earl of Eglinton staged a famous tournament at the family's ancestral seat of Eglinton Castle. Through marriage, the chiefs of the Montgomerys also hold, in addition to the Earldom of Eglinton, the Earldom of Winton, while the family motto is, Watch Well, and the crest is a woman holding an anchor in her right hand and the head of a savage in her left. Which, if you've seen my leg tattoo, it's on there. <coughs> All right, the last chapter. Fame and acclaim. There is one little picture here before I do that. Just a little one. All right, let's get to it. The Montgomerys continued their proud martial tradition in later centuries, most notably under Bernard Law Montgomery, first Viscount Montgomery of Allenmine, Allenmine, 
who was descended from Montgomery, who had moved from Scotland to settle in Donegal, Ireland in 1628. Born in London in 1887 and affectionately known to his troops as Monty, Montgomery <clears throat> saw service with the British Army in India before serving with distinction during the First World War when he was awarded the DSO for the gallant leadership of his men. Appointing commander of the British Eighth Army in North Africa in August of 1942, he defeated the Axis forces of Germany and Italy at the Battle of El Alamein in October of that year. Knighted and promoted to general, he later commanded the 21st Army Group, made up of the Allied ground forces that took part in the invasion of Normandy <clears throat> in June 1944. I didn't know that my family was in the... In the okay. It was Montgomery who also accepted the surrender on May the 4th, 1945, of German forces in northern Germany the Netherlands, and Denmark. Created first Viscount Montgomery of Alamein in 1946, he later served as the chief of the Imperial General Staff. Often a rather outspoken and controversial figure in later life, he died in 1976. That's the year I graduated high school. In the world of literature, Alexander Montgomery, that's I-E at the end, Born in Ayrshire about 1545, was a poet who served as poet laureate to the Scottish royal court. Lucy Maud Montgomery, born on Prince Edward Island in 1874 and better known as L. M. Montgomery, was the Canadian author who wrote a series of novels that began in 1908 with the Anne of Green Gables and ended 1937 with Jane of Lantern Hill. That's a famous book, that Anna Green Gables. On the stage, Elizabeth Montgomery. Well, maybe that's my sister. Elizabeth Louise Montgomery. We call her Betsy. Who was born in 1933 and died in 1999. Was the American actress known for her role as Samantha in the popular American comedy series Bewitched that ran from 1964 until 1972, while Anthony T. Montgomery, born in Indianapolis in 1971, is the actor who has starred in the Star Trek Enterprise television series. His grandfather, John Leslie Montgomery, better known as Wes Montgomery, was the highly talented American jazz guitarist who died in 1968. In the world of sport, Jim Montgomery, born in Madison, Wisconsin in 1955, as the American swimmer during the 1976 Montreal Olympics became the first man to break the 50-second barrier in the 100 meters freestyle event. On the golf course, Colin Montgomery, born in Yorkshire in 1963 of Scottish parentage, is the popular golfer also known as Monty. His father, James, was the secretary of the Royal True Golf Club and the young Montgomery became one of the first British golfers to study at an American college, attending Houston Baptist University. He first entered the top 10 in the official World Golf, World Golf Rankings in 1994, and at his peak was ranked as number two. His career has been subject to various ups and downs, but in 2005 he returned to top 10 ranking, the same year in which he became the first man to win 20 million euros on the European tour. Could I have some of my Montgomery money? Even if it's euros. John Montgomery, born in Scotland in about 1750, immigrated to Virginia with his family and became a famed explorer. He was on the boat, I already know this, with Lewis and Clark because one of my older relatives, it's still, he passed, but he gave me that information before he died. John Montgomery. He founded the city of Clarksville, Tennessee, and gave his name to Montgomery County, Tennessee. Also in the United States, Montgomery, Alabama, was named after Rick, uh, General Richard Montgomery, a renowned commander 
who was killed during the late 18th century American Revolutionary War. The most famous of all Montgomery's is currently alive, born in Louisville, Kentucky, and now lives in Key West. William Virgil Montgomery III goes by the nickname Bucky, but he has now changed it after reading this to Liam. The end. So that was like a lot of our history, and I didn't know a lot of that. The Montgomerys. Motto, watch well. Crest, a woman holding an anchor in her right hand and the head of a savage in her left. You've seen my tattoo. It's on all of our stuff. I see it all the time. Territory, Renfrewshire, and Ayrshire. There is, or was, a castle in Scotland in Ayrshire called the Montgomery Castle. It is way down in ruins. I didn't see it, but I drove past it, not knowing it was there until I was about heading home. Anyway, hope you learned something about our family name.